So my brother sister Islam, at this point, the only people that are left, with the people being thrown in Jahannam one by one, with the kuffar going to Jahannam one by one, are the Muslimin and the Munafiqeen. At that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show his shin, at which point they will be asked to prostrate, no one will be able to prostrate except the Muslimin. And the Munafiqeen will not be able to prostrate, and so they will, they will stand out, so they will be dragged into Jahannam, into the worst and the deepest parts of Jahannam. At that point, alhamdulillah, the people that are there on the day of judgment, standing on that day, they will be mu'mineen, the muhideen, the musalleen. These people will stand and they will be brought together and they will be hoarded towards the hawd of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The hawd of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a very beautiful place. And of course, as you know the hadith, before a person goes to the pond of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a group amongst them will be taken out. These are the people of bid'ah. The people who prayed and fasted and did good, but however they did innovations and so they will be taken away and unfortunately they will be thrown into the fire as well. But the Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, the people upon Tawheed, they will be hoarded together onto the pond of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The pond of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a very beautiful pond. It has ten important characteristics. What are the characteristics of the Hawd of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Number one, it is square in size. Number two, it is each side is as long as the distance between Sana'a in Yemen and Medina. So it is a couple of thousand kilometers in length and in square in size. Number three, the number of stars, number of stars in the sky are like the number of cups that are on the sides of this pond in order to drink from it. Number four, it is as white as snow in color. Number five, it is as sweet as honey. It is as fragrant as musk. Number six, Number seven, it is as cold as ice. When you drink from it, it is as beautifully cold as ice. Can you imagine after 50,000 years of standing, something so sweet, something so fragrant, something so cold. Ya salam, I can just taste it. I don't know if you can taste it, but I can taste it right now. Yum. And that is the beautiful water of the Hawd of Rasulullah Then the Prophet said that the number of, that there will be huge birds that, that will actually swim on the pond, and they'll be like huge swans with their necks like giraffes. This is authentic report of Rasulullah ﷺ. Then the next attribute the Prophet told us is that when someone drinks from the pond of Rasulullah ﷺ, they will never ever get thirsty again. Ibn Kathir rahimullah reports that the hawd of Rasulullah ﷺ is in two places. One is inside Jannah and the other one is outside Jannah. So there's a hawd inside Jannah and there's a hawd outside Jannah. And the hawd which is outside Jannah is fed by pipes from Jannah to the hawd that is outside of Jannah. For the inside of Jannah feeds the water to the hawd that is in the outside of Jannah. And whoever drinks from it will never ever get thirsty ever again. Alhamdulillah. So my brother, sister Islam, and that is where we will meet Rasulullah Wasallam. Yes, Salam. For the first time we will get to meet Rasulullah. How amazing, exciting would that be? Can you imagine? That would just make it all worthwhile. Make it all worthwhile. The drink first of all, alhamdulillah, no more thirsty. Meeting Rasulullah fantastic. What an amazing time that would be. Just to meet Rasulullah hug him, kiss him and say, Ya Rasulullah, I believed in you, I loved you, but I never knew you. And alhamdulillah, Allah has joined us together in this day. Ya Rasulullah, make dua to Allah that we all go to Jannah together. However, the Prophet will not smile as yet. He won't smile because something hugely dangerous is going to come up. What is that? As we finish drinking from that pond and meeting Rasulullah we will come to the Sirat. What is the Sirat? The Sirat is a very, very, very sharp bridge. The Prophet said it is thinner than hair, it is sharper than a sword. So what is thinner than hair and sharper than a sword except that it's un- unbelievable? What is thinner than hair and sharper than a sword? It's unseen. It is invisible. And it is a sirat that is over Jahannam. Can you imagine Jahannam? And over it is this invisible bridge, practically invisible bridge. And that is why when the prophets of God see the sirat, they will say, Ya Allah, Sallim, Sallim. Oh Allah, save us, save us. We're going to fall into it. And that is why you can never cross the sirat until you have tawakkul on Allah. Because you will have to put your feet forward thinking that Allah will save you. And if you don't have tawakkul and no trust in Allah, you will never be able to walk in the Sirat. Ya khwati, we will all have to walk in the Sirat. You cannot go to Jannah without walking on the Sirat. And to, to add to the suspense and the danger, there will be these claws that come out from Jahannam to drag people into the Sirat. 
Also in the authentic hadith is reported that the sirat has horns and thorns. That when someone tries to cross, it will, their bodies and their limbs and their clothes will catch onto them and they will get stuck and then the claws will come and grab them by the necks and pull them into Jahannam. This is the sirat. Very dangerous bridge. No one will cross into Jannah until we cross over the sirat. It sounds like a fairy tale. Sounds like a Hollywood movie. It sounds like Indiana Jones. Well, guess what? This is real. That's not real. That's a movie. This is real. This is going to happen to each and every one of us. And so we will cross the sirat at the level of our taqwa and fear of Allah. The first people that will cross will cross at the speed of light. And they will cross so fast. Others will cross at the speed of a fast horse. And then fast camel. Others will be running. Others will be walking. Others will be crawling. And some will fall in. No doubt, they will fall in. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save you and me from falling into the sirat. Ya Rabb, oh Allah, don't make us from that. And remember what happens to the sirat. After people cross into the sirat, the sirat will be thrown into Jahannam. And you see what Ibn Qayyim said? He says in his Nuniya, Oh my people, don't become the sirat upon which people cross into Jannah, and then you yourself are thrown into Jahannam. What a wise statement of Ibn Qayyim. We should not become the people through which people enter into Jannah, and then we ourselves are thrown into Jahannam. How is that? Well, I should not be the person who tells you about Islam, and then I don't practice it myself. I tell you about being taqwa and having taqwa and fear of Allah, but I don't do it myself. I shouldn't be the person like that. I shouldn't be someone telling you to give charity, and I don't give charity myself. No, I should be of the person who gives even more charity than you. And you should be the same. كَبُرَ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَن تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ It is a great sin in the eyes of Allah that you should say something that which you don't do. So don't be the sirat, my brothers and sisters in Islam. So my friends, finally people come to the Qantara, which is a place just outside Jannah. This place is called the Qantara because this is the place where two Muslims, a good Muslim and a bad Muslim will all be there, but they will be judged between each other. Remember, until now Allah hasn't judged between a believer and a believer, only a believer individually has been judged. But now a believer and against another believer. What issues do I have against this brother here? What issues does he have against me? Because we will not be able to enter Jannah until we forgive each other. So if you have died without forgiving anyone else, guess what? You will be judged on the Qantara. On the Qantara, your issues against other Muslimin will be judged and you might actually lose your levels in Jannah. Even you might actually go to Jahannam still if you have harmed too many Muslimin, and all your good deeds are taken away, and you are left with nothing but bad. So this is a dangerous position. Do not, my friends, do not ever insult a Muslim. And let me tell you, I'll tell you something, which was going to shock you. Can I just say it? Yeah? I think a lot of the people of Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India will be stopped in the Qantara. Do you know by who? By our servants. I have no doubt about it. You know our servants? You know these people that are cooking for us and cleaning for us? We are so bad to them. We are so rude. We slap them, we hit them, we don't pay them on time. You think that Allah is going to forgive us for that? Because you're a master? I mean, you act like a slave and a master. He's a worker for you. He's not a servant like a slave. He's just a worker for you. These people will stop us on the qantar, I'm telling you. Because we are so bad to them. We are so bad to them. We must never ever be bad to any Muslim out there. Let them sit at your table and eat with you. He's a human being, not an animal. Let him sit next to you. Give him clothes that you would wear yourself. Let him have a shower in the same shower that you shower. Give him perfume that you put on yourself. The Prophet said, your slave is your brother. Your slave is your brother. He eats from the same food and wears the same clothes. This is for a slave that you own. What about a servant that you don't own? He's just a worker, a salaried team member of your team. Imagine how we treat our, our household workers. Wallahi, they will stop us from the Qantara. Fear Allah, don't be bad to them. Otherwise they will stop you from the Qantara. Be, be very wary, Wallahi. Be very wary, never ever mistreat these people who are there to help you and look after your affairs. And especially it makes me really sick when I see children behaving like this to their, to their household workers. A'udhu billah. Arrogant, arrogant. Be very careful. So ya ikhwati, alhamdulillah, 
All our affairs are dealt with. And now there is either one of two destinations. It is either Jahannam or it's Jannah. Let me tell you a few things about Jahannam first. Jahannam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is huge. 70,000 rings in each ring, a wire, a rope with 70,000 angels pulling it. Huge, massive. For 70 years it has been kindled until it turned red. Another 70 years until it turned white. Another 70 years until it turned black. So it is a Jahannam that has been kindled with fire. And its fuel is men and stones. So every time the idols are thrown into it, then they, the flames come up. Every time men are thrown into it, more flames come up. And the flames are huge. The f- flames are huge. إِنَّهَا تَرْمِي بِشَرَرٍ كَالْقَصْرِ كَأَنَّهَا جِمَالَةُ الصُّفُرِ What is it? إِنَّهَا تَرْمِي It throws out sparks. بِشَرَرٍ كَالْقَصْرِ Sparks as huge as houses and castles. The each spark, can you see the sparks are tiny, but the sparks of Jahannam are huge like castles. كَأَنَّهَا جِمَالَةٌ sufur, Just like it is running, runaway camels. Right? And wallahi, the fire is terrible. Because anyone who enters into it will be made into huge sides. The Prophet said the seat of the non-Muslim in Jahannam is a distance between Makkah and Medina. Just the chair. Can you imagine how big the bodies will be? The Prophet said in the authentic hadith, the molar tooth of the non-Muslim in Jahannam is the size of Uhud. Mountain Uhud. Can you see how big their bodies will be? Why will their bodies be made so big so that they feel the punishment even even more? And ye ikhwati, before you start thinking that oh, we will only go to Jahannam only a little while, like we, just as if we're touching something hot like that. Before you think that, I asked my shaykh who was a mufassir of the Qur'an, very well known, I call him an encyclopedia tafsir, Shaykh Abdullah Tawajiri, who used to teach us tafsir in Medina University, I said, Ya Shaykh, what is the lowest amount of time that has been mentioned in the Qur'an of how, how someone who enters Jahannam will enter for Jahannam? What's the sh- smallest duration of time? And he told me, Wallahi, there is no mention of any short duration of time except one verse, which is in Surah Naba. And there Allah says in the Qur'an, Inna Jahannam kanat mirsada لِلْطَاغِينَ مَآبَ لَا بِثِينَ فِيهَا أَحْقَابَ What is that verse? Verily, Jahannam is a place of ambush. It is a place that where the taghin, the worst of people will enter, the wrongdoers will enter. Then Allah says, لَا بِثِينَ فِيهَا أَحْقَابَ They will dwell therein, أَحْقَابَ And the shaykh said, أَحْقَابَ means plural of haqab. And haqab was described by Hassan al-Basri to be one million years. So, many millions of years. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Subhanallah, please, please, please. Don't take any sin lightly. Don't take any sin lightly. It's not light. Oh, it's only a light sin. It's only chota sa, chota sa, you know, pap, you know, small sin. And that's why the Sahaba said, you consider sins to be like a small fly that is sitting on your face and you simply buzz it away. We used to consider every sin to be like a huge bout to crash down on our heads. Ikhwati, you can't, you can't. Small sin. Look at this hadith which is Hassan, reported by the Sahaba who said, that Rasulullah said, anyone who looks at a woman that is not halal for him will have molten lead poured on his eyes on the day of judgment. Ikhwati, it's serious. It's serious. It's very serious what we are talking about here. And I know that what we have described sounds very, very difficult. Some of you might be saying the shaykh is all about Jannah, Jahannam, Jahannam, fire, this, that. That's the reality, but the problem is that is the reality. The day of judgment is all about fear. It's all about danger. It's all about being wary of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ittaqu rabbakum. It's about fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what the day of judgment is all about. This dunya is about enjoyment. Then will come a terrible test, which is the grave and the day of judgment. And of course, Jahannam being the culmination of it. In Jahannam, there are two valleys that we know of. One is called the valley of Ghay. The valley of Ghay is a valley which is made of fire, molten fire. And that valley, according to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, is the valley in which the pus of the people of Jahannam when they melt, when the bodies melt and the pus comes out, that is where the pus accumulates. And that is the place where people who don't pray will go. فَخَلَفَ مِن بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ أَضَاعُوا الصَّلَاةَ 
shahawat fasawfa yulqawna ghayya and thereafter follow there were people who follow their desires and did not pray and they will enter the ghay the ghay is a valley in jahannam where the people the pus of the people of jahannam accumulate there is another valley that will be the, for the people who don't pray as well and they are the people who pray but they delay their prayer until the time is about to run out and this is the valley of wail fawailul lil musallin has two meanings it means woe to the musallin or it means the valley of wail which is made for the people who delay their salah ya ikhwati my brothers my sisters islam stay away from jahannam fear allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jahannam is a terrible place it is a very very terrible place and it does not become satisfied until it has consumed so much of human beings and their bodies alhamdulillah if we lead a good life and we fear allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we will finally enter jannah and this is the last thing i will talk about inshallah as i finish off if we lead a good life and by good life i don't mean the good life that we think which is in the movies or in the advertisements a beautiful house in the prairie with a young wife and a, and a nice convertible car and no 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 i don't mean that a good life i mean a good life meaning a life of struggle and difficulty in the path of allah a life of working and praying a life of struggling in the cause of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala working for the akhirah not for the dunya if we lead a good life working for the cause of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then allah will give us jannah what is jannah jannah is the prize of allah the most amazing place allah has created every single one of us will enter jannah whilst we are the age of 33 years old and we are 60 feet tall and 7 feet wide in the image of our father adam alayhi salatu wasalam in the beauty of yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam will be made into 120 rows 80 rows will be from this umma 40 rows will be from the other ummas and we will be from the first of the 120 rows 80 rows from our ummah and 40 rows from the nations of the past and we will be made to stand in rows each one of us will be called from eight gates of jannah jahannam has seven gates but jannah has eight gates each gate is one amazingly important ibadah an act of ibadah such as fasting the gate is called ar-rayyan then there is a gate for salah a gate for those who give sadaqa more a gate for those who did jihad more Ya ikhwati, it's important that we have our names on these gates. We must excel in one, a minimum one type of ibadah. In salah, or in zakat, or in giving, in jihad, or something or the other. We must excel, must excel above everything else. So that we have our names written on these gates. Only a few people will be called from all the gates, such as Abu Bakr radiyal anhu. But others will be called from two gates. Perhaps someone who fasted and prayed a lot will be called from two gates. and others will be called from more more than that but if you don't have your name on one of the gates you will not be able to enter jannah and so alhamdulillah as we are made into rows we will go to the gates each gate is 70 years distance in between each gate is 40 years of travel and as we go to each gate they are massively huge we will not be able to enter until first rasul sallam enters and then thereafter we see our names on the gates and then we will be able to enter As we enter into the gates something really amazing happens. Well, at the at the base of the gates there are these huge springs that throw water on our faces and cleanse us from all the difficulty that we had in the day of judgment and the plains of day of judgment. As we enter into the gates straight away before we enter into the gates then these beautiful heavy brocade of silk and green clothing are brought out that are made from the tuba tree are given to us so that we may wear it. and beautiful ornaments are put on our bodies as our bodies start growing big into the size of adam alayhi salatu wasalam our ornaments are put upon us and beauty envelops our faces as we enter to the gates a huge wind blows directly have you seen the wall of air that, that blows sometimes in order to save the coolness of the inside from the heat of the outside that blows upon us a lot of perfumes as we enter into the gates and as we enter we see angels rank and rank in front of us and they will see and we will see angels rank and rank in front of us and we will see them saying salam and salama peace peace upon you for what you have done and the prophet some said in the authentic hadith of sunan tirmidhi a person when he enters into jannah will be straight away able to recognize his place as if he knew 
his place just like he, the day he was born. So we will know what, where our place is. We know that we will have to go here and there, ref, because our house is there. And your friend will know he will have to go that way. Don't worry, we will know the way into our homes. Also the Prophet ﷺ said, a person, the last person who will enter Jannah, in authentic hadith in Sunan Tirmidhi, the last person who will enter Jannah, will see his kingdom in front of him, for 2,000 years travel. 2,000 years travel. Can you imagine that? How much palaces and gardens and rivers and, and families and, and ahibba over there. Can you imagine how beautiful for the last person who will enter Jannah, subhanAllah. The last person. And the last person who will enter Jannah has everything in this dunya and a hundred times than it. A hundred times of what this dunya has. The last person that will enter Jannah, subhanAllah. As soon as we enter Jannah, the first thing that will be given for us to eat is a very succulent fish. If you don't like fish, don't worry. You will like it on that day. Okay? It's a very succulent fish that you'll get to eat. It's an appetizer. Okay? And that's just to taste our mouth and to get us accustomed to the beautiful food that there will be in Jannah. As we look down on the ground, we will see beautiful ornaments and we will see pearls and rubies. And you know what will happen to people? They will start to grab these pearls and rubies because they've never seen them before. But what are we? And the angels will look at us surprised and say, why are you grabbing them? Don't worry, the Jannah is full of it. So, okay, alright, sorry. <laughs> Leave it back. As you will see the earth, the earth will look like musk. And there will be, the sand will be like saffron. And everything smells beautiful. As we see a tree, as we see a tree and we see beautiful fruits upon it, as soon as we want to eat from the fruit, the tree will bend forward into its branch and put the, put the fruit in front of our faces. That is the meaning of the verse, Kutufuha Daniya. Kutufuha Daniya. What does that mean? Ibn Abbas said, that when you desire a food in Jannah, the tree will bring its branch close to you, so you can bite its fruit, and then go away when you don't want it anymore. Also Ibn Abbas who said, in Jannah when you see a bird in Jannah, and you want to eat it, as soon as you want to eat it, it will become barbecued in front of you. Can you imagine? You don't have to go and then shoot and bring it down, send your dog, get it here, skin it alive, then cook it, clean it, wait for it to cook, then curry and check it, is the salt enough or not? None of that. Straight away it becomes cooked in front of you, subhanAllah. In Jannah are rivers of wine, of honey, of milk, and of so many other types of juices that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. But whenever you want to drink, you don't have to walk to it. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu mentioned in the tafsir of the verse, that whenever you feel like drinking something, a spring will come up, and you just open your mouth and you just drink from it. A spring will come up wherever you are. Whatever you want. You feel like honey? Mm, ah, open your mouth. How amazing is that? Okay, no, no difficulty, no stress, no pain, no sleep, no beard by the way. So brothers, no more beards. No beards in Jannah. Sisters, no hijab. No hijab in Jannah. And that's why Aisha radiallahu anha once looked at these women who were mutabarrijah, they were displaying themselves with all makeup on their bodies and walking in front. And Aisha radiallahu anha looked at her and said, enjoy it in this life. For you it is in this life, for us in the akhirah. MashaAllah. <laughs> okay, so no hijab in Jannah. Also, one more thing which I, I think I should mention, is that in Jannah you will get to see the jinn, but the jinn will not be able to see you. Like in this dunya, the jinn can see us, but we can't see them. Well, in Jannah, we'll be able to see the jinn, but the jinn won't be able to see us. Alhamdulillah. We can finally get them back, right? Because they can see us. But Alhamdulillah, we'll be able to see them in that day, inshallah. That'll be really good. As you walk into Jannah, you will see a huge lightning in the sky. And this is authentic hadith of Muslim Ahmed, that a person when he walks into Jannah, will see a lightning in the sky. Then he will ask an angel, what is this lightning in the sky? Hayya Hisham. You know about the lightning? I'm sure you're waiting for it. So you will see a lightning in the sky. So you will say, what is this lightning? And this sudden lightning, and another lightning, another lightning. It's a bit like this house that I'm staying in now, this guest house I'm staying in. Sometimes the light goes away, and the load shedding happens. Have you noticed it? Suddenly the light comes on and it goes away. The sudden light comes on and say, Ya Allah, make this the smiling of my Hurul Eid. So what is this lightning? A person will ask this angel, what is this lightning in the sky? What's this lightning? And so the angel will smile and say, don't you know? No, what is it? It's your wives in Jannah who have just been told that you enter Jannah and they're smiling. So when they smile, it causes lightning in the sky. That's much, that much noor in their face. Ya Salaam. 
What? The sisters are completely quiet. <laughs> That's okay. Brothers, this is our time to enjoy, right? So Alhamdulillah, you go into Jannah and you see your palaces, you'll see two types of palaces. One of gold and one of silver. And outside the palaces, you will see these khaymas, which are these hollowed out pearls. They are these khaymas, which are like these tents, hollowed out pearls. 70 yards distance and 70 yards height. And these are the hollowed out pearls. This is your place where you will have your tea and your high tea. You know your high tea before your lunch? So you have your high teas there. But your lunch and your food, that's all inside your palaces. Palaces are beautiful. You will see the inside from the outside, the outside from the inside. And underneath the palaces are the rivers. Can you imagine water chalets? Have you ever been to water chalets? Come to Malaysia, I'll give you water chalets. And the beautiful water chalets that are built upon the beach, under which the rivers and waters flow. And this is what our houses will be like in Jannah. Where we will, our houses will be on top of these beautiful rivers of wine and milk and honey. Ya salam, how amazing is that? And of course our wives in Jannah. Wives in Jannah, they are made from saffron, not from soil. And if the women of this dunya can be beautiful, but they're made from soil, what about women made from saffron? La ilaha illallah. And Ibn Qayyim rahimullah describes the women of Jannah in 70 verses. And he says they are exquisitely beautiful, exquisitely pretty, very, very tempting. They are equal age. They are abkara, they're virgins. Every time you sleep with them, they become virgin again. So you will, they will never ever be except virgins all the time. They will sing to their husbands. They will eat with their husbands. In one authentic narration is reported that a woman will sit with her husband on the banks of one of the rivers and she will grab a glass of wine and give it to him and he'll grab a glass of honey and give it to him. And he will, she will hug him and sing for him. And she will say, do you know when Allah married me to you? And the man will say, no, when did Allah marry me to you? He said, that day, remember that day when you were really struggling so hard in the cause of Allah? And you were struggling and you still you said, I will continue on despite all the difficulties. On that day Allah looked down and He saw you struggling and on that day Allah married me to you. Ya Salam, you have to continue on struggling brothers in Islam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of the difficulties you go through. And you don't know how many rewards Allah is writing for you because of the difficulty you go through. Subhanallah, only on that day will we find out how Allah, our noble host, our Lord, knows everything we go through and what rewards He has prepared for us on that day. So a man will find two wives of the Hur'in. Every man will have two wives from the Hur'in. A martyr will have 70 from the Hur'in. And a person may have even more than that. In the authentic hadith, it has been reported that Rasulullah said, anyone who holds back his anger for the cause of Allah will be brought out on the day of judgment. And he will be made to say, choose from the most beautiful hurul in Jannah. Because of you holding back your anger for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ikhwati, when a person sees his wives from Jannah, he will then be called for the mardiyah. There is someone called the mardiyah, a special wife for every single person in Jannah. Who is that mardiyah? Mardiyah is the princess of the Hurul Ain. So even more pretty and more beautiful and more attractive than the Hurul Ain. Who is the Mardiyah? Mardiyah is the wife of that man in this dunya. So my sisters in Islam, you will all be princesses of the Hurul Ain. So imagine, Ibn Qayyim rahimullah says, that does the king ever think about his servants when in the presence of the princess? No, he doesn't. Because the princess is even more exquisitely pretty and beautiful than the servants. And that is why the women of this dunya, you went through difficulty, you went through struggle, you went through strife, you went through abuse for wearing the hijab. Why will Allah give you anything less than the Hurul Ain? He will give you more than the Hurul Ain, and He will make your husband madly in love with you more than even the Hurul Ain. So don't you ever worry that Allah will ever take something else away from you. Never ever feel like that. Never ever read the verses of Hurul Ain in, in, in the Qur'an and ever feel like you will be less than them. No, you will be better than them inshaAllah. So when you know them and you read about the verses, think that inshaAllah Allah will give you more than that. Walhamdulillah, this is the life that you will lead in Jannah. And then we have one last day left. On the day of Friday will be an amazing day. On the day of Friday, the people of Jannah will be called together. And they'll be all called together and gathered together. When they're all gathered together, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask the people of Jannah, O oh, people of Jannah, is there something that you want from me? So people of Jannah saying, will say, Oh Allah, 
We want you to forgive us and be happy with us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, will tell him that I will never ever be angry with you ever again. I'm always going to be happy. Is there anything else that you want? And so the people of Jannah will say, Ya Rabb, what is there else that we can ask? And so Allah will say, and there is something even more beautiful than that. On the day of Friday, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show himself to us. Ya Salam. We will be able to look at the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amazing. وُجُوهُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ نَاظِرَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَ On that day the faces will be beautified and pretty, amazed and looking at their Lord. This is people looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you imagine looking at Allah's face? Looking at the amazing, beautiful face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day. And people would not have been given anything more pretty and more beautiful than that. Everything, all of the blessings will be nothing compared to the beauty of looking at the face of, of Ar-Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ya ikhwati, on the day of Friday, the angels will come with their burraqs, and they will take you to one common place in Jannah, where all of the people of Jannah will be together. And they will all sit together, ikhwanun ala sururin mutaqabileen, all the people of Jannah. Can you imagine looking to your right, finding Shaykh Muslim and Oh, hello, Shaykh Muslim, I taught you a book by the way, and what did you mean by that verse when you... MashaAllah. Can you imagine? There'll be Khalid and Walid there and the Salahuddin here, inshallah. Amazing, amazing. Imagine going to Jannah and you finding all the people of Jannah from all levels all together for meeting on that day. How amazing would that be? All with goblets of wine, with little servants serving us, and all of us talking about the blessings of Allah. No, no prayer, by the way. No salah, no khutbah, no nothing like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause a, a rain to fall on that day, as Ibn Qayyim says from which Allah will bring more blessings into Jannah every Friday. So every Friday, new blessings and new beauties in Jannah. As we finish our gathering and meeting, the angels will take us down from our thrones, and we will go to the markets on the Day of Judgment. The markets of the Day of Judgment has been described in Muqayyim in 30 verses in his Nuniya. He says, the markets of the Day of Judgment are amazing. When you walk on the markets, each angel will be bringing the most amazing contraptions and creatures and different things for you. So imagine, what do you, what do you feel like? A convertible, what do you feel like? A Porsche, do you feel like a Corvette? What do you feel like? You know, do you feel like, a, I don't know, PlayStation 10? What is it that you, that you feel like? What is it that you feel like? And the angels will have it. So when you go to an angel, you will say, I don't have any money to pay you. But the angel will say, you've already paid for this. Remember that deed that you did? Here you go, this is for you. So every single Friday, we will come back from the markets of Jannah with the most amazing contraptions for us to play with. Ya ikhwati, of the most amazing rewards that Allah will give us on the Day of Judgment in Jannah, is Allah will give us the ability to have children in Jannah. Each and every one of us can have children with our wives. Our wives can have children, and the pregnancy will only be one hour, and on top of that, the pregnancy is only one hour. And on top of that, the baby will be at the age that you want. You know the age that I want? Is this one and a half to two years old, that's it. Because they're so beautiful at that time. They're so amazing, they smile at you, they run when you open the door, they hug you, they give you the sloppiest, the wettest of kisses, yes salam. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the blessings of Jannah and the ability to have our children in Jannah. My brothers and my sisters in Islam, We've spoken about the hereafter. All of this of what we said, that is from the authentic sunnah and the authentic Qur'an, is all true. It is going to happen. There is no doubt about it. There is no doubt about it. And every single one of us has to prepare for this. We must prepare for this. We must be in this dunya just like Abir al-Sabil. Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib aw Abir al-Sabil. Be in this dunya like a stranger or someone who just passing through. Please, ya ikhwati, let's prepare for the akhirah. Very diligently prepare for the akhirah. Don't take this lecture simply as a feel-good lecture that you feel good and you had a good laugh and a good smile and felt a bit of pain and a bit of happiness and then you go away. Please don't. Because ya ikhwati, all of this is going to happen. And so my friends, the best of us are the ones who prepare for it. How do you prepare for the akhirah? How do you prepare? My first advice, my first advice is rectify your knowledge, your tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Please make sure you gain knowledge and you gain as much knowledge as possible, especially knowledge of Allah and your tawheed of Allah. The one thing that will guarantee you Jannah, despite all sins, is if you are upon tawheed, never committing shirk with Allah. Then Allah will forgive all your sins and enter into Jannah. This is number one. Number two, your salah. Your salah must be perfect. Never ever miss your salah. Never pray your salah late. Never ever do it late, always on time at the earliest of times. Don't let the adhan come except that you are in the masjid already. Do not delay it. Make sure your salah is the most important thing that you are always looking after. Number three, my brother sister Islam, you've got to seek a life, a life of struggle for the deen. You've got to do with your life something amazing. You've got to live a legacy behind. Something for the cause of Islam. Please don't worry about money. Money will come. I'm a medical doctor, but I work for the akhirah too. I use my medicine only as a tool, not as my vision and my goal. I use it to simply aid me in my role of my being a da'i. But I don't spend my time thinking that, okay, my vision, my goal is just medicine. No, I use it to help me in the work that I do. You might be a businessman, you might be a teacher, you might be an engineer, whatever it is, use your profession to help you to reach the akhirah. Do not spend all of your time for your profession. Your profession is simply a tool to help you with wealth or money or status or power or opening up a new channel of helping others, whatever it is. But it is not the goal and purpose of your life. Your purpose of your life is building a legacy with your life so that you can inshallah answer on the day of judgment why it is and what you, it is that you did with your life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help me and you build a legacy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us Jannah, save us from the terrible torment of the fire, save us from the punishment of the grave and enter us into Jannah without accounting. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just, uh, just two minutes inshallah. We're going to end off with a small little recitation and um, uh, uh, then inshallah we are going to uh, end. <coughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا الشمس كورت وإذا النجوم كدرت وإذا الجبال سيرت وإذا العشار عطلت وإذا الوحوش حشرت وإذا البحار سجرت وإذا النفوس زوجت وإذا الموؤودة سئلت بأي ذنب قتلت وإذا الصحف نشرت وإذا السماء كشطت وإذا الجحيم سعرت وإذا الجنة أزلفت علمت نفس ما أحضرت فلا أقسم بالخنس الجوار الكنس والليل إذا عسعس والصبح إذا تنفس إنه لقول رسول كريم ذي قوة عند ذي العرش مكين مطاع ثم أمين وما صاحبكم بمجنون ولقد رآه بالأفق المبين وما هو على الغيب بضنين وما هو بقول شيطان الرجيم فأين تذهبون إن هو إلا ذكر للعالمين لمن شاء منكم أن يستقيم وما تشاء I would like to thank everyone for coming. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.